That's all. That's the end. All right, Tiffany. Thank you for coming to my show. Thank you for having me. Talk with Sunia. So I want to get in, you know, because we know each other from grad school. We've been Mm -hmm. friends since. Um, You know, you're doing the whole wellness thing. You're a licensed marriage and family therapist, your own practice, actress, writer. Uh Tell me a little bit about that. So um, as you um, said, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, Before, But before I became a therapist, um, I studied theater. And I began my career as an actress. And then as I was on that journey, I realized that I was really interested in helping people who are suffering. So I thought that was something that I really wanted to explore more. And at the same time, I was like, oh, if I'm a therapist, I can have my own schedule. Then that'll leave me time to go to aud- on auditions. And then it just took on a life from there. Okay. So you said you... Did it for like flexibility, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I know your skill set. So I don't want you to just say you did it for flexibility because you really have the skill set as a seasoned therapist. Yes. Well, I mean, like I said, I also was interested in helping people heal. Like I would always hear stories of people like who had died of overdoses and different things. And I would wonder to myself, like, why, what, what happened? Like what happened with them? And people would say stuff about people like, oh, well, they were just on those drugs. And I would say, but what was wrong? Like I always wanted to know why. So I, people would always ask me for advice too. So I was like, okay, so I think I'm already the therapist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was for flexibility, but I felt like I was killing two birds with one stone. So let me ask you this: Like, have you ever thought to combine the therapeutic perspective into like the theater world? Combine? I have thought about that. Um, there are times, like, uh, I feel like acting. And therapy are closely related because it's like you're dealing with people, right? Right. And what makes them tick and what makes them happy, what makes them sad. So I have thought about that. And um, as you know, we are like, (laughs) we have some projects where we're writing and we're trying to bring more of the mental health aspect into, into, to people through our writing and through our skips and the scripts and the stories that we tell. Right. So we're working on a project together. I actually forgot the name of the project, the um, show. I don't think we officially titled it. Okay, because yeah, I was like, I don't remember the show, the, the name of the show. But we wanted to showcase, like, from a therapeutic side, from a client side, but also showing that, like, we're real people that deal with real life issues. Yes. And it- Go ahead. I was going to say, and also share it in a way that is true. Like us as therapists, I think we have a firsthand, like, um, examples of how stories should be told. So better for us to tell them because we know, right? Right. And sometimes you see stuff on TV and you were like, ah, oh, that was almost right. But you, they wouldn't have really done that. Or when, I think the, the most frustrating thing to me is when I watch a movie and I see how they do therapy and I'm like, that's, right. that's. That's not real therapy. So people come to therapy thinking it's what they've seen on TV. And I'm like, that's not at all what we do in therapy. Yeah. Yeah. We don't just sit here, take notes. You lay on the couch and we just listen to you for an hour. That's not how that works. Right. And say, how do you feel? Right. Right. (laughs) Right. I mean, an unseasoned therapist may do something like that. But really, a therapist is really supposed to challenge you. So with that project, you know, we've been running into like some barriers with trying to find. I didn't know. When we start writing this, that we were going to need a literary agent. I'm like, hey, we dope writers. We put it out, knock on the door, boom. But Mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's not it, right? Well, um, yeah, but I think we we just got to keep pushing it and we'll see exactly what happens. If we want to decide to go the agent way, then, you know, we do that. But I feel like there are other ways that we can get, we we can get. See, but you know, you know, the the entertainment side. Mm-hmm. And so you have that knowledge to like, okay, we could do different avenues where I'm just like, uh, I just feel like we just knock it on the door and it's like, I want to get in. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Well, we just got to see. We got to see what happens. Take every, take it one day at a time and figure it out. But it's I know it's gonna be I, a dope show. I can't wait. I know. I'm I'm excited. It's about gonna it be too. a real dope show. Yeah, of course it's us. <laughs> <laughs> for real so I want to talk a little bit about like your you do a lot of healthy stuff like you do a lot of working out you do a lot of videos pertaining to that mm-hmm. and it's not just videos it's really your lifestyle exactly so yeah I do 
It's so funny because I'm always like, most of my videos are about like working out when I'm a therapist. But I think it's really about what I discovered. I started running when I was in college and I saw the benefits of like it relieving stress and how good it made me feel. So as I've gotten older, I've realized that the, one of the big questions I get in therapy is how can I get happy again? And I think a, a recipe for happiness is doing the things every day that make you happy. And one of the things that makes me happy is be working out because I feel good after that. Right. So I do. I try to do a little bit of something that makes me happy every single day. So I post a lot of that. And I think it has tremendous mental health benefits, physical benefits, and emotional. So it's like you don't go wrong. Nobody has ever said that they regret a workout yep. after they're finished it. They regret it before they start it. Right. And then afterwards, it's like, I'm glad I did it. Exactly. So let me ask you this. Like, in terms of being a therapist, like, do you feel like it's important to surround yourself around other healthy therapists or just healthy people in general? Because it's kind of like once you're in a field, it's like you connect with other people in the field. I don't know how that happens, but mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. just seems to happen. I think just healthy people in general is okay. I think when you're when you surround yourself with other healthy therapists, it's, you have they can identify with certain things more than others. That's why sometimes if I have some issue, I'll call you because it's like okay, as a therapist, like right, what do you think right. about this? But I think as long as you're around people who are a positive influence and are like minded, whether they're a therapist or whether they're just a friend, it works out. Right. So I want to transition a little bit into something deeper in terms of like uh, mother daughter relationships. Obviously, I'm a mom. You have mm -hmm. a daughter. We both have daughters and we're daughters. Right. Uh -huh. um, my biggest thing with relationships with children is if there's no influence, you really can't have an impact. And I believe in any relationship. So like in terms of like having a daughter, you know, mm -hmm. having a mom and having that example or not that example, how do you feel like that is like, what part does that play in terms of like mentally with the daughter, with their mom and having that influence over like their decisions and different things like that? So it's interesting you bring this up because my very first clients as a licensed therapist was a mother and a daughter. Mm. And they called me and I was like, I was all pumped because I'm like, okay, I'm about to get my first clients as a licensed therapist. But then I was like, what do I do with a mother and a daughter? I was like, nobody talks about that. Like you do couples, you know, at school, individuals, all kinds of families. Yeah, you do now that you think about it. But not mothers and daughters. So I, I was like doing all this research. I'm like, let me see, like, what, what are some common topics? So I come across this book called The Mother Daughter Puzzle. And it was such a blessing because what it discussed and what I learned is that because of the unique history that we have as women, like history of being oppressed like um, years ago, that it's tremendously affected the mother daughter relationship. Mm. So like elaborate. So like if you think about um, some years ago, women couldn't work certain places, couldn't go to school. Most of the time had to be in a household where they took care of their bro the, the siblings, they had to take on that role, right. right? Whether they wanted to or not. So as the years have gone on, now equal, rights are pretty much equal in the workplace and um, equal going to school and all that stuff. But the emotional toll that it took on our, uh, the, pre the previous generations in our families, the emotional toll that it took not having those choices trickles down into the mother-daughter relationship. So like, let's say, three generations ago, mm. your great grandmother couldn't go to college. Mm. Now she's looking at her great granddaughter who can. Mm -hmm. And it's like a silent envy because they were emotionally silenced and it, emotionally they were silenced. Some, I mean, you could only do certain jobs. Imagine if you want to be an engineer, but all you could do is go clean a house and what that does to you emotionally. And that's what, what creates the strain as the generations go down. And the disconnect, like, the, you know, exactly. you hear sometimes, um, just in general, where a younger female will go to an older female in the family, and they, as a matter of fact, prime example, I just had a conversation with my cousin. Mm -hmm. This was, like, last week, and she was saying that our, our aunt, who is, like, my parents' age, and she said she was telling her she'll never find a man if she can't cook. And, exactly. And so I'm like, it, it's, it's, it's a trip. So it made me relate to that. Mm -hmm. how disconnected 
the generations are exactly. um, in terms of like, yeah, that that was in that time when women were at home with the kids and were the caregivers and had no other choice. Had no other choice, but it made sense if you're at home taking care of the household that you would cook. But when both people come home from a nine to five and, and equally tired, why is it the woman's responsibility to then the to cooking. cook? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. And a lot of times back then, roles were static. Whatever your grandmother, w- w- if she died, the, then the um, your mom would take on that role. But as generations have, like how society has changed, women are working, like you said. So who takes on the role of the grandmother, you know, if she passes away, if that mom is at work? That creates a tension because the dynamic changes. Do you know what I mean? And then is that you clear? terms in like like uh, the grandmother babysitting the kids, like or whatever, whatever the grand, uh, uh, whatever the grandmother used to do. Roles like in generations ago, roles were kind of very similar. But now, since so like say there was a grandmother who stayed at home and then she passed away, then the next person in line would do that same job. Oh, I get what you're saying. Okay, but if the next person is she has a she has a job. Like you're saying, and your grandmother was the her key. She was a key figure in bringing everybody together every week. But on Sunday, now you're tired because you did because you were working. Right. Then that place kind of gets a little bit uh, not that it gets unstable, but there's the roles don't really pa- don't really pass down the same. Right. Does well, it, it does make sense. Just like if we were talking to our kids right now, you know, the generation after us, they want to be influencers. Mm-hmm. And so where a parent is like, well, how do you get a degree in being a social media? They don't get it. They don't understand that there's my, I remember being a therapist at a high school and a senior in high school already making over four thousand dollars a month. And her sharing with me that her friend's parent got upset because they were saying she was lying, but she wasn't lying mm-hmm. because the parent couldn't comprehend how is somebody in high school never entered into college, hasn't even graduated high school yet, probably making more than them. Right. And so I do think like with we we, instead of us embracing it and saying, hey, you know, this is something new, this can happen. Why do you think like, especially, you know, generations before us hold on to these ideologies of like, that shouldn't be done. Like, you're not going to find a husband if you don't cook and these (laughs) different things that, they were accustomed to being Mm -hmm. their norm. Right. Why do I think what? I'm sorry. That they can't, like, what is it about that, like, generations that they can't get past? Mm. Like, there's things that are evolving, and it doesn't just stop with you. Right. I hear what you're saying. Well, in regards to the um, mother-daughter generational situation, I think it becomes which I failed to continue to make this point earlier, is that another thing that causes the strain is if the older generations were emotionally silenced, she's unable to hear her daughter as well. So like all the ways that the mother... What do you mean? Let's elaborate. Okay, so if you grew up in a household where your needs weren't met... Okay. And you were uh, silenced all the time, when you have a daughter... And she's trying to, like, let's say she's rebellious. You can't hear that because you haven't given yourself the space to hear your own voice already. And it doesn't, and it's not 100% of this, you know, it's all not the all time, the time. But it happens, but it happens often more with, than not. And that's that tension because we have those emotional, that kind of those emotional wounds that we experience uniquely as women because our emotions were silenced for so long because we couldn't do certain things and we couldn't say anything about it. We couldn't go. We couldn't get that job. You know what I'm saying? If you, like I said, if you wanted to be an engineer, you couldn't. Like, like what we have now. We, if you wanted to go to school, I know someone who told me that their grandmother wanted to go to college, but her dad told her that well, he, she couldn't, and he wasn't gonna pay. So you just mm. needed to stay here. So imagine she, that person, that woman. She's probably like 77 now. But imagine like how you'd feel and how 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 long she's taken that emotional like. You know, emotional kind of scar. Not, um, it's not a tremendous scar, but it's a scar for some. I, yeah, for some it would be. Yeah, you're right. It would be a scar. Not being able to do that, and how, like, let's say she sees her granddaughter go to college. If that's not healed, what that's gonna trigger? I didn't even think about it, but you're right. And it it brought me when you said like that emotional scar that e- being emotionally or verbally silenced. It brought me back to 
the Betty Wright, you know, when the, the, the advice of if your husband is cheating, you just stay and you suck it up and you be quiet and like how things have tremendously changed. But before, even before me, that was something that was, that was taught. normal. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, he cheats, he beats you, be quiet, you take it. You stay in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I think even how like generations evolving, I see like mentally from a healthy perspective, how we're getting better. Like that's no longer tolerated or it's no longer. So I remember I was watching, um, I went to go see, what is her name? I can't think of her name, but I went to go watch um, a biopic about uh, a famous, was it Gladys? It wasn't Gladys Knight. What was the last one um, that they had? uh, She's a singer. The last one that who had ah, the oh, the last movie that came out about like a famous singer, El, El, uh, Etta James. It wasn't Etta James. It was after that. Um, Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin. Mm-hmm. She was the one that had a baby like at twelve or something. I'm not sure. I didn't. Okay, watch I think it was Aretha <laughs> yeah. Franklin. Needless to say, we're in the movie theaters, and it was like a scene or something where she basically got into a fight with her husband. And like the older generation, you know, it's like a bunch of women in the theater and they automatically was like, watch her come in with the, with the sunglasses. And it just made me think like that was normal for them. Like you, yeah, you got beat up by your spouse. You just put sunglasses on, even though it was an unspoken like conversation. Everybody knew you had a black eye, but you didn't talk about it. So as you're talking, it's making me think of things like that, where I'm glad that we're breaking those unhealthy norms but at the same time most people will say and then i want to go spiritual too because you know me (laughs) like most people would say like um you know now women are taking on the the role of trying to be a man so how Mm -hmm. do you feel about that when it goes back to you know from a spiritual or biblical standpoint the man is the head of the household Mm -hmm. well when he's aligning himself and following god right but it's like what do you think about it when there's controversy saying that women are now trying to be men? So I don't think that women are consciously, and this is just my opinion as Tiffany. And this is a rhetorical question because right. I got a whole spiel. But <laughs> yeah, I think that it comes from generations of women experiencing the kind of um, having the experience that you're talking about being beat and being silenced and them telling their daughters grow up, get a job. So no man got you. So you don't need a man to take care of you. Right. Right. And then that becomes what's in, you know, what's in that their narrative, right. And what they're going to do. And that's all they know. That emotional part I'm talking about still wounded. Right. Cause grandma so, never, trauma. never, right. never healed that either. So now that part isn't, you know, that it's not balanced. I think it's totally fine with, you know, a woman getting a job and all that. Absolutely. But as long as it's balanced and you're able to know um, when to assert your feminine qualities, when to use your masculine qualities and have it balanced. I like how you put that. Perfectly put. But then my mind went to another corner. Okay. It, it hit a corner because I'm like, Many times women are stepping in roles because they don't have a choice. That's true too. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, where a lot of men back then, they took care of the household. You don't necessarily have in. Okay. Let's talk about this because even if a man had like a a child outside of the home, it was like taboo kind of like, okay, this kid exists, but nobody knows not to say that was right. Cause that was unhealthy too. Mm-hmm. But now it's like people are making households and all these different, they got kids here, kids, there, kids there, which one is the household and which household do you take care of? So I think women have had to be in a position to step in that role because men weren't doing their job to be in that role. What, like, what do you think about that? I do think there are definitely ca- cases where women have had to step into the role and be, you know, and be the mother, the father and everything else. And I think in those situations, you know, she has no other choice. Like she has to get it done. But I also think that there a lot of times can be a flaw in who we're choosing to create these families with. And that is our fault, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that we have to be more diligent on what, and honest about what we want when we're dating people 
and don't get caught up in situations that can put you in that kind of, you know, situation. And not to say that it's always the woman's fault or anything like that, but I think that, you know how you have these examples of women with PhDs and kids with Ray Ray. And it's like, how did this happen? <laughs> right. Like, right. what are your goals here? Like this, how was this, how did this even happen? Right. Like, right. And they slashing tires and you're like, but can I say this? A PhD doesn't mean healthy mindset either. It does not. And I think that that goes to when, cause no one will tell me that they, they were never in a broken state. I believe we're all broken until we figure out who we are and become whole. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think you just come out the wound and like, Oh, I'm just this whole healthy person. I just exactly. don't believe that. I believe we're broken until we find healthiness. So I think many times we get with mates in a broken state, not recognizing that we're broken. And then later on, when we get the healthy concept, we're like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. this looks distorted. And, you know, even going back to who's teaching us, like, you know, preserve yourself. Like, you know, and I see so many young people and just people in general, like they're adamant on having to be with someone Well, everybody wants companionship. No one wants to be alone, but it's just everything is rushed. Like, you know, That's a guy true. too much. You already live with him. Like, what have you really learned about this person? But not even so much of what have you learned about this person? Like, what do you really even know about yourself? Mm, that's true. Yeah, it's true. Because we do get into these relationships, choosing people out of wounds. Just yes. To feel wounds. Common wounds. Mm -hmm. Bonding tra over trauma. And not really having, like, I'll... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be in therapy with women all the time where they'll, they'll say, oh, I want a partner. And I'll say, okay, so what, what do you want? What does that look like? Right. And they can't answer the question. They can't answer it. Or they have a list, and then the person they date, they not, there's nothing on the list. And I'm like, how, how, are we making, how are we making this work? Like, do you, under, do you see the flaw in this? And they're like, yeah, well. So I'm like, so why are you with this person? And they can't really answer it. So, and that's more so what I meant about, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't mean to imply that PhD meant better. But people think that. They, they think do. because you have a PhD, a master's, or you're in a certain field, that it comes with a certain mindset. And you right, know us being healing. in the field, mm -hmm. it does not. Mm -hmm. It, 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 it totally really, doesn't. truly does not. It just means you went to school and you passed some tests and wrote some papers. But that, I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. It doesn't really tell me who you are as a person, right? How you are emotion, if you're emotionally as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I want to go to this cause this is my biggest fear. Most people don't know this, but I believe in walking it, how I talk it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like I could say anything to anybody, right. Mm -hmm. And not care. But for me, I take this serious cause I have two daughters. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for me to basically tell them things and not live by it, like that's, like, you know how, like, a person has to confess to their mate like they cheated or a person has to confess to their parents they did something? My, my daughters are like my, like, it's in that same sense. Like, if I was a, ever, like, if I ever done something that didn't match mm -hmm. and having to look in their face and own that, that would be devastating to me. That, hear what you're and, and so that's, like, huge for me mm -hmm. because I never want to teach them something that I'm not walking. I'm telling you don't smoke. I don't smoke. Right. I'm telling you not to drink. I don't drink. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you not to sleep around. I don't, I'm telling you these things that I don't do. Cause I don't believe kids do what we say. I think they do they what do we what do. We do. Yeah. So like, what is your take on that? Having a daughter? Mm -hmm. Cause like, that's like my greatest fear of messing up and having to look at them in their face and say, ah. right. You I know what I mean? Right. Like yeah, I yeah. could just imagine being single and then getting pregnant or something to slip up and have to go look at my daughter's face and tell them, like, like how do you even have that conversation? You know right. what I mean? No, I hear what you're saying. And, and, and uh, yeah, that's a f I, I totally hear what you mean. And there are times when um, I've had to, because of that, though, I've had to, like, say I, I, I got too angry and I, like, yelled. In a similar way, I, I get taunted by make sure, making sure that I apologize so that they know that that behavior wasn't right and so that they don't, you know what I'm saying, take, they, they don't think that that behavior is normal. So if I do something and I slip up, I'm like, okay, I have to make sure that I say that I apologize, express what I did wrong so that they know that that behavior isn't acceptable. And I don't, 
as much as like how you said you don't want to you you wouldn't want to like ha- have a baby or something then have to face them what i I'm like that for myself. Like if I learned a, p- a piece of information, like um, say you share something with me and I'm like, ooh, like God is speaking to me on that. I need to do that. I can't not do it. You know how some people can have information, know they're supposed to do something and know they're supposed to change it, but don't do it. Right, right. I'm the kind of person where it will haunt me. Like it's like you know that you are not and you need to do it right. It becomes like this immediate thing. Or right. Like you have to do it right now or you will die. Like that's how I feel. Um, but when it comes to the kids, I have to make I, I I have to make sure that I always apologize and I'm always doing the I don't I for you look think about it before I don't always think about it before but I'm on the back end like oh yeah I jacked up so let me make sure that I go back and say I apologize that wasn't the right behavior don't repeat this that's a fear to me you know what I, mean? I don't I don't know what it is I'm like dang am I am I tripping like I <laughs> no I think that we're just very like reflective. Yes, because mm-hmm. it's like I remember my cousin was at my house and they throw the beer around casually, and I'm just like that. Do not call me on my name. Call me by my name. And my daughters was sitting there, and I knew my cousin didn't mean any harm by it, even though everybody knows. Do not call me that. <laughs> and she kept saying it, and I'm just, but she's saying it to different people. Then she said it to me, mm-hmm. and it was like my daughter's just sitting there. She wasn't sitting, and I know she was thinking like, I'm about, I want to see what my mom is about to do. And I could tell, so I had to check it immediately. Because for me, it's like they're watching me. That's a sense of, you know, most people don't take parenting seriously. Like, they think, oh, I just have kids. Like, to me, I feel like it's it's kids are something that God entrusted you with. Like, if I drop my kids off to the babysitter or drop them off at school, I expect for you to make sure that my kids are okay. And if they're not, it's a problem. I see the same thing with having with kids with God. He's entrusted us Mm. with his kids. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do your due diligence by them, you'll be in trouble. But the funny thing is, it's not that much pressure with my son that it is with my daughters. And I feel like because as a woman, I'm giving them a blueprint of what a woman looks like. And I'm always, when I make decisions on how, what I post on social media, how I'm carrying myself, how my dialect is, who I'm speaking to, I'm always consciously thinking of my daughters. Right. I hear what you're saying. That's true. They're always watching, always listening, trying to see. I make that face because my kids are smaller. Oh, than that's yours. my daughter. Let me be in a conversation. She just be like, she acts like she's not listening, mm-hmm. but, but listening to listening. everything. Yes, yeah, to reflect. Yeah, you. I, I, that's so true. I, I totally, I totally agree. So how do we? So okay. Because I don't know, that's just me. I don't know if our generation, that's you, Mm -hmm. is like that. But just imagine if, well, you know what? They probably were doing that. They just did it, the generation before us. You know, thinking, get beat up, get cheated on, get this, do that, do this. And I want my daughters to see this. And I think they were doing the right thing because if they didn't, they wouldn't have basically spoken into the next generation. Just like my aunt. And she's 60 something years old is telling my cousin as, oh, she's like, my cousin is 50. Oh, you ain't gonna never get married again because you don't cook. And I'm like, what? Like, are we evolving? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like she's an RN makes really good money works. So you think she really want to come home and cook? My solution is, Hey, get a chef, do something. We, you have this day. I have this day, but I'm like, this is really the the mindset of thinking in today's time, right? This is yeah the uh, that's been imprinted. Like you still have to cook, you still have to clean, and if you don't, you're not worthy. Wor- like worth okay. is another yeah. big okay. thing, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Touch on that because mm-hmm. I I think a lot of because of those uh, those kind of roles that have been put on us, like this is what a woman is supposed to do. This is what, you know, this is, these are things that women are supposed to do when we don't do it. Like our, we question our worth. Um, there was this article that, um, talked about women and how, like even the attachment theory is based on, well, because your mom didn't. Yeah, you're right. You're Everything right. I is about think the about woman. That. You're right. And if you show like the nurturing of what the mom didn't mm-hmm. do in attachment theory, you're right. It's always putting all the, all, you know, all the, 
the the responsibility. Blame, yeah. The blame and response. And if you think of like, um, there was some pictures they showed where women were dropping their kids off to the um, daycare and the babies were crying. They never show men like in those, you know, in those pictures, it's always us. But so we feel a lot of times we get this idea from society that if we don't do those so-called womanly roles, that we're not valuable. Like, how am I supposed to get a man if I don't know how to cook? Because he's going to want me to cook. And then when you and when you put your worth just on that alone, that, and then and then and you don't have and you don't have a partner, then it's like, oh, it's, it's just a I'm big, doomed. Right. No, low self-esteem. But you know, what's, you know, what's crazy. Even when I was a kid, I always said I was going to have a chef. I never like, seriously I from, from the, the if you ask my, my parents, if they will always Sania always says she's going to have a chef like some women, they love getting there and cooking. I do not enjoy cooking. I did it. Uh -huh. Out of a duty when I was a stay-at-home mom, because obviously my husband and my kids have to eat. Right. But to just go in there and, and recipes, and that is not my thing. Creative, like right. writing, speaking, mm -hmm. but that's my thing. So it, it, it takes me to, like, when people talk about roles, it's like you guys just put women in a box and say, this is who you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. According to who? Right. Because everybody, every marriage, every relationship, you create it's your different. own dynamics. Right? Your own roles, your own rules, and your own dynamics, as you say, of what works for your household. Exactly. And what your strengths are. That's big. That's because it's thing. based on, because you might have a guy that can cook. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's based on, I always say, the thing that works for my marriage is we know each other's strengths and weaknesses. There's just certain things I'm just not going to do. There's, like, he don't clean up. I don't want him to clean up because mm -hmm. it's not going to be, I don't want you to wash my clothes because you're not, but I'm not going to clean up either. So I got a, I got a housekeeper. Right. You understand what I'm saying? It's other alternatives. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a do or die situation. And I think back then it was either this or this. Well, right. how come it can't be this? Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that created the emotional wound. Cause what if you were back then and you had to cook, but you couldn't cook, you were shamed. Like what was it? Or like for a woman that can't, Bear child. Exactly. Ooh, yeah. That's a really that's one that's a really big one. Movies about that. Right. So so yeah, it's like when pe when women can't do it the they their feelings of worth, uh they, they begin to feel unworthy. And that's that's really hard because especially when they don't know how to balance it with overachievement. Like, say you have a Ph.D., but then you don't like you don't necessarily know how to cook sometimes. How can I explain that to make that a little a little bit more clear? Women will begin to not know their value without the job. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So if it's like if you so if you don't have. The so if I didn't have a Ph.D. and I couldn't cook, I'm 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 worth nothing. Mm -hmm. But the fact that I have the Ph.D., it gives me a little leverage and worth. But I really believe and tell me what you think about this. Self-worth doesn't come in. You know what? I had Dr. Mayo, Sunia Mayo on my social media. I felt like the Holy Spirit, God came and told me, take it off. Mm -hmm. And because he told me to get away from titles, because he said that man looks at titles, meaning people look at titles and they respect you. Because if you put doc, when I go in and I say I'm total different, total different treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Versus I'm just this person. Say I'm CEO, total different treatment, right? And so people respect titles. But my thing is, that degree, that title does not define who Sunia is, right. you know? And I think we need to get away from that because I think so many times we put so many emphasis and value on titles and you and I know in our field, knowing doctors, uh, therapists, whatever, mm -hmm. that the, the, the title has nothing to do with this, right? Correct. The mindset. And so it's like, when do we get away from the sense of looking at titles and looking at the value my thing, how I value someone is by integrity and character. When do we look at that? I guess it depends on when we were taught that. Because my these a lot of women, their grandmother taught them, you, you could just go to school and get go to college, get a job, so that no man will have to take care of you. That's been that part, like that other part of value that's not associated with the cooking, cleaning, or going to school hasn't isn't often taught. Because how do you teach it? What do you say? To teach it? Mm -hmm. What the cook and clean? Which part? No, no, no. no. Teach the your the per, the teach the individual their value. I think that starts from childhood. Mm -hmm. So and how I, would you do? How I, would... Always telling my daughters they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
talking to my husband, making sure, well, I don't make sure he does it on his own. He dates them. Always bringing out their skill set. I'm proud of you. Even you said apology. I think that goes a long way. Many times parents do something. Parents have this ego where it's like, I'm writing you. No, with my kids, even if I don't feel like I did what they're saying I did, the fact that I offended you, I'm sorry. Because That's I good. want them to feel validated. Mm-hmm. I want them to feel like they, they're hurt, they're seen. Mm-hmm. You know, we were growing up, it was a whole saying, kids are meant to be seen, not hurt. Like, basically, you saying we don't right. have it's a voice. True. You know it's what true. I mean? Mm-hmm. And so, even with my youngest, she's, oh, she's very outspoken. And most people will be like, that's disrespectful. But how is it disrespectful if she's saying the truth and she's really saying things how she feels? It's no malicious intent behind it. I'm not going to silence her. Right. right? She might be the next president. She may be a great debater, a great lawyer. Unless you, you're not going to go back and forth with me, but I am going to listen to hear what you have to say. Uh And if it's making sense, we're going to have a dialogue about it. I'm not going to just be like, shut up, Mm -hmm. you know, because all that plays into their identity. Exactly. So that's our generation with our kids. But for the generation of women who may be our age, a little bit younger, who didn't have mothers that are like us and allow them that voice, how do they learn that value? You know what? That it, this is my thing. Most people uh, say, I didn't have. Mm-hmm. I didn't do. Right? I remember when I was in school, we had them encyclopedias. We, that that, that was information. Mm-hmm. In today's time, information is like a fingertip away. Mm-hmm. And so there's podcasts. There's there's so many. You can get on social media and see somebody giving you some knowledge. And so to me, it's like, it's not how can we teach? What do you want to learn? Because at some point, it's no longer like, oh, someone needs to teach me. At some point, it's like, no, I need to, I need to, because I want this, I need to go figure out and see where I can get this information from to learn it. That's That's totally true. But what about when they don't realize that this, that they need the information? That's a whole different story. <laughs> and so I always say this, a dysfunctional person does not know they're in a dysfunctional household or family until they see something different. This is why I always encourage clients, people around me, just anybody in general. Mm-hmm. I think it's so important to not always be around the same people, to not always do the same experiences, to have the same hobbies. I think you need to open up yourself up to different people and different things because by doing that, you get a different perspective of life. That's true. You know, just if you talk to Billy or Shelly that you've never spoken to before, what is their family dynamics like? Mm -hmm. What did they come from? Oh, now I'm talking to a a Middle Eastern Muslim. What is their culture like? It gives you, not to say that you have to take on these people's beliefs and ideologies, but it opens your mind up to something so much greater Mm -hmm. than what you know. That's what I'm saying. We was growing up, you really didn't have access like that. Now, you could basically tap into something with somebody in Afghanistan and know their whole life story. So it's like, to me, it's about knowledge. Okay, for example, people tell me all the time, I don't watch TV. Right. I don't I don't watch TV. Show me your social media activity. You don't you watch just as much because they said, like, I don't watch TV like, oh, (laughs) like it's a good thing. It is like, well, show me your activity. How many hours you've been on social media? Like you're not making no money from social media. You're just watching people all day. So my question is, what are you choosing to watch? Because even in watching things, you can watch stuff that's going to teach you. Right. It all goes back to self. What are you willing to learn? That's true. Some people are more open to learning and gaining information. And some people are just stubborn. They think they know everything and they're not. Or they just don't want to know. Yeah, they don't want to know. Some people are content with the lives that they they, that they live and they don't have any desire to basically change. But I want to go back to the the daughter and the the mother dynamic. Because I was saying in the beginning how I believe you without influence there's no impact and what I mean by saying that if I was disconnected from my daughters Mm -hmm. and if I didn't have a relationship I'm gonna throw my son in this too with my kids then I don't think they would listen to me and I don't think people understand how huge that is I'm not gonna say your kids is gonna listen to you every single time because they're not but I really believe in order to have an impact with anyone there has to be some type of connection or relationship yeah I agree with that I was listening to a podcast And the um, psychiatrist said that we've normalized screaming at children too much. Oh, no. Or raising your voice. And how 
um, detriment, detrimental that can be to the relationship. Their self-esteem. Yeah, and their, and their, and their self-esteem. So, yeah, I think now I, just, now I just lost a train of thought. What was your statement? Because I was saying <laughs> so I was that. I was asking you, how do you feel like basically impact, influence, relationship, and connection with an individual or a child? Right. The, um, I think that it's important to make sure that you do have some type of connection that you're listening and validating, you know, the kids at any, at, at the kids, your children at any given moment so that you have that connection because sometimes we're too busy telling kids like what to do and there's no connection. And then the next thing, you know, they're 14 and they're not telling you anything. And it's like, okay, well you guys were never really connected. You were just telling them to do stuff and they were responding to it cause they had to, but there was no, like relationship genuine, right no relationship and I had connection. to learn that the hard way and I had to go back and undo some things because even with parenting it was like you have to do because from the time they come home do your homework right time to eat take so everything is orders versus trying to see how are you mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. was your day you have to consciously think about that and sometimes you're doing so much that you're not thinking about what you're thinking about you're just trying to get all the tasks done. Right. And because this, you, you, it's hard. But we have to come to terms with our kids are not tasks. They're people. Well, not the, yep, yeah, you're right. Not the kids, but I'm talking about our task in general. Cleaning, no, 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 cleaning no, no. Clothes. I get what you're saying. Yeah. But then we put the kids on the task. Because if I'm like, do your home, that's a task. You're right. I have to make sure your homework oh, is I done. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I got to make sure you fed. I mm -hmm. got to make, that's a task. Mm -hmm. And so getting caught up in the task, we forget the human. Exactly. It's like a robot. You're just moving and moving and moving. And a lot of parents don't understand that dynamics and they come to therapy and they're like, fix my kid. And I'm like, nah, we need to fix you. Mm -hmm. It's not the kid because you, you're conditioning the kid to just feel like once, for example, my daughter told me, all, all you do is tell me always. She said, every time you talk to me, you telling me what I didn't do. Mm -hmm. Cause it's a task. Because mm -hmm. I'm making sure you're doing what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it made me feel messed up. It made me feel real bad. And I was like, and my husband's like, do you realize every time you talk to her? And I was like, because when I'm coming home, I'm, this ain't done, this ain't. And so now it's like I go, have to go in a room, hey, you know, how are you doing? How was school? What's going on? What's, I don't even mention it. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. we have to get away from that. Right. It's huge. And people don't understand how big it is mm -hmm. because then your kid gets becomes an adult. Then they're not coming home for, you know, family holidays and you can't figure out why you don't have a relationship you don't with have this a kid. Connection. Yeah. And that's you know what? That's extremely true because I, I saw this woman on Instagram. She does uh, gentle parenting or whatever. I forgot the exact, I shouldn't say or whatever, but I forgot the name of it. And I wish I could think of her name, but she she talks about how to parent to have like a connection with your child. And I tried it once and it was so scary, but it worked like because you I don't my son was doing something. You know how boys, they got a whole bunch of energy. And I kept and I always tell him to stop. He don't listen. Boys don't listen. So her her she had these five steps of what you want need to do I mean what you should do when you want your kid to listen they're having a tantrum so she said the first thing you do is make eye contact and tell them that you love them first mm. before you make before you say that you know whatever it is that you want them to do so I tried it I think he was like jumping around so I said come here for a second he was like why so I came and I made eye contact and I said you know I love you right and then he's like, yeah. I was like, the reason I don't want you to do that is because I don't want you to hurt yourself. And I, no, he didn't want to brush his teeth. I said, I don't want you to get any cavities. So you need to brush your teeth and, you know, do everything. And then I didn't think he was listening. And then the next thing I know, he went and brushed his teeth. And he came, he's like, okay, I brushed them. And, but when I was talking to him, it didn't seem like it made a difference. But then he went later and he did it. And I, and I let it go. Like, I didn't keep asking him. But then he went and did it later on his own. And then he's like, see, I did it. And then I was like, wow, that like really worked. But it, it was very vulnerable. And I don't know why it was, I guess, because we get so comfortable with it's easier. I mean, I don't spank, but I figure it's probably easier just to spank them and say, do what you, you know, go do what I told you to do or scream and say, did not tell you and put it on them rather than to take the moment to like and figure out solutions exactly something that can bring you together 
versus push you, you apart. apart. Yes. Because I'm like, if I look at him and just be like, you know, like in his face, like, I, like, not like I don't tell him I don't love him, but I didn't do it like that. Right. Like in that kind of situation, I was like, he gonna think I'm kind of off. Like, you know, like what? <laughs> you know, and he was a little like, okay, but he went and did it. Right. Right. And. It works. So I think, again, like I said, that connection and the way we approach it and just just and, it, and I didn't have to make a do a lot. It ain't like I had to have a long conversation to make right. that connection. Right. It was just the way I approached it. I want to say two things. I spank whip whooped with my older two, mm -hmm. the youngest. When we were in our grad program, well, before then, we've never whooped her. Mm -hmm. Don't do not have issues out of her, though. You know what I mean? And so. It taught me there's other tools that you can use versus just pulling out a belt. But see, yes. that comes from slavery, too. Exactly. Slave master whipped them. Mm -hmm. Then they whipped their kids. You, and, and it just went on and on. And it's like, no, I don't have to. I can actually have an intellectual conversation with my daughter right. for her to get it. And she's proof in the pudding. The youngest, we've never, we've never hit her. Mm -hmm. And I don't. It's not hard to get her to do something because she not. knows when I'm serious. But then I also want to say how I admire you because I love the fact even though you're a therapist, a lot of therapists can, well, not a lot. Some therapists can feel like, I know this is my field, but I watch you. You always make it a point to educate yourself. I'll never forget this. When I came to your house, Ella was like, how, like a, how? She was like, like two. No, she was a baby. I don't think she was two. Was she two? I don't think she was even she one. Two? No, oh, really? because she was in a crib. She was a baby. Oh, okay. So she was. And I remember coming to your house. And I don't, we was, we was hanging out and you're like, I'm about to hold on. I'm about to go put her down for a nap. So I'm thinking in my head, like this baby going to be screaming and hollering and you going, you going to have to get back. So why are you going to put her for a nap? So I said, Tiffany, I was like, you going to go put her in her crib. I was like, and what? And you was like, no, she just going to go to sleep. So I'm like, okay. In my head, I'm thinking, yeah, right. Uh -huh. So you go put her in the crib. You had like a baby monitor where you could see her. And you was like, I was like, let me see. She went right to sleep. And I was like, how did you master that? You had told me you had read something, the baby whisper. I don't remember what you said. Some <laughs> it book. Was a book, yeah. Yeah. And you was like, and I do this every day. And, and I was like, this is kind of dope. Like, she's a therapist, but she's not saying, I know everything. Right. Even though I deal with this stuff with my clients. Like, I'm taking a conscious effort to get the education now that I'm a mother and basically figure out how to put these principles and tools in place for my kids. I, I tell people that story all the time. Because <laughs> I was just so amazed. Like, okay, this baby forgot to get in his crib and cry. And she laid down and went right. To, you don't remember that? I do not remember. But I do remember <laughs> that was a time. No, I don't remember. There was a time where I, I was, re I know I was reading a book, though, about putting her to sleep. So I know the book you're talking about. But I don't remember the specific, like, situation. I tripped out. I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, let Is me see. Really gonna work? Yeah. I'm like, let me see. I was like, oh, she really went to sleep. Yeah, I was I was going through it. But I finally figured that out that time. Yeah, it was yeah, I remember that book. But yes, yeah, because I, I feel like social media can be horrible, but it also has a lot of great information. And so many different, like you mentioned earlier, there's so many different perspectives of people and like how they approach things. And I don't agree with everything, but they're little pieces that I can take from parenting, from this, from that, that are beneficial and that I think are helpful that I never thought of. So I'm always learning and trying to like gain additional information. And even if it doesn't work for me, sometimes you get clients that aren't in the same belief as you. Yes. So knowing something that can help them, like if you're not Christian, I know this other way that can help you know, based on something that I read or something that I saw for you to look into, it's still you have the more information you have, the more helpful it is for other people. I think even what you said, touching base, because we're taught as therapists basically to go from our client's framework. Like, say I may be a Christian, they may be a Muslim, but I'm to work with them according to their framework. And I think that even goes back to, like, relationships with, like, family members or even your kids or just friends in general. It's like, because we're accustomed to like, well, this is my way, so this is right. And I think even working with clients, I even bring that home. Like, if I don't agree with something my kid is saying and it just doesn't make sense to me, I always try to get it from their level of thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we don't have different religions, but we have a different way of thinking. Right. We have a different perception. Mm -hmm. We have a different way of analyzing, right? Mm -hmm. And so I always keep that in mind, like, 
you know, that really don't make sense to me. I don't understand why you did. But I'm going to come from a place of seeing it from your perspective and speaking to you from your perspective. Right. And, and, that, and that's so true because everybody only sees things through their lens. Right. But other people have a totally different life than you. So the way they interpret things or the way they experience things is so different. I had a client the um, just recently, and she said that she was at a Rams game, and there was this um, guy behind her screaming, like on the on the phone, on FaceTime with like some friends cussing, and she was really upset because she was with her older parents. They were like seventy, and he they he's like cussing, being all vulgar. But what she decided to do, she said. But I decided I'm, I was going to befriend him because at least if I befriend him first, then I can say, oh, my parents are here. They're kind of older. Can you just tone it down? But she didn't want to try to go and criticize him, like not having established, you know, some right, type of right. like communication. So she went and she started up the conversation with him. Well, it turns out he was on this FaceTime because his cousin was playing in the game. Mm. And then as they began talking, he was like, she was like, oh, yeah, I'm here with my parents. He's like, those are your parents. I've been cussing. And he but he was in a whole different world. But at first, she was really upset. She was like, I can't believe this guy. He on FaceTime. Who's on FaceTime at a game? This is so stupid. This is what she was saying to herself. But she decided not to look at it and yeah, kind of step it. into his world. And then she realized why. And it's like, he, was, he you know, he had a whole different storyline. And then she felt, she didn't feel bad. But she was like, I'm glad I approached it this way and didn't just try to assume, assume what was happening. And she was like, and that gave her just a different perspective on life in general. And I think that's such a great example. That is a good example. Of how, you know, you see something, but somebody else, they live a different life. They live a different life. And I like what she did, but I didn't like what she did. And I'm going to tell you why. Oh, why? <laughs> I didn't like what she did because to befriend someone, it's like, okay, you're not, a, a, let's say you, you don't believe in marriage, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're still pushing your ideologies on someone because let's say he didn't care how old they were. I think as people, we have to be content and okay with everyone is not going to agree with our values. And so if we're in a public setting, I can't make you do what I want you to do because these are my parents, because you also That's have true. to understand and accept if I'm out in the public, I'm basically opening myself up to whatever happens in the public. And I think so many times we want to control what other people are doing. And we got to learn within ourselves. Like if I walk out, if I'm in my house, I control the tempo and environment and the atmosphere of my house. But when I walk out my house, it's free game. I can't control other people. The only thing I control is how I learn to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said I liked it, mm -hmm. but I didn't like it. I see what you're saying. Um, Right. Yeah. The, the manip, well, not manip. No, kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you said it because that's what I wanted to go to because it's a form of I'm going to befriend you to manipulate you to get you to do what I want you to do. And, and that's not okay. You have to be okay with this is how this man talks. We are in a public setting at a game. Even like, okay, when I was growing up, we didn't curse around adults. We uh -huh. just didn't. You, even if you did, if an adult was there, I don't care if you didn't know him. You wasn't going to do it. And we had, you know, I have a contract at the juvenile hall. And we did like a um, a completion or certificate of completion ceremony where we, you know, they graduated from a phase of the program. And it's, it's youth authority. So it was 15 to 25 or is it 16 to, I don't remember. But they're cursing and, and you know, I'm like, and then I had to check myself. Mm. Like, who are you? Right. You know, I can't. You can't just, oh, you, this is how they speak. So I'm in their world. Who am I to then, because of my age, say, hey, you're being disrespectful. No, this is how they're speaking. I cannot, that's what I would say to my kids, but mm -hmm. these are not your kids. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be mindful that we can't just change somebody's behavior according to our values, cultures, and standards. Because, yes, yeah, she was manipulating the situation. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I just think she was. A little embarrassed for her, you know, for her for her parents. You know, when you were older people, look, and they like. And, but I hear what you're I'm saying, not though. You can't because as long, look, you that's you can't be embarrassed for so you you took your parents to a Rams game. <laughs> you, you took. Uh -huh. be, let's be realistic. No, I know what you're saying. A football game, and this is what they do: they drinking, they arguing, they cursing people out, they trying to fight people. That you know, it's from a different 
uh, cheering a fan from a different team. This is what happens at a Rams game. No, that's true. That's so you point. can't put your parents in a certain situation and then expect them to like hold your values and norms. That's not a reality. Mm-hmm. So she was 100% manipulating the situation. Well, <laughs> she got what she needed. <laughs> she got what she needed. I liked how she approached it, but I didn't like how she went about it. You cannot, for, we can't. Mm-hmm. But, no, I know what you're saying. You can't force your values on other people. No, mm-hmm. no. Like, let's say even a kid, like, you know, it's, it's a lot of things in the world that we probably don't agree with, but they have different norms than us. Mm-hmm. They have different values than us. We may have our household norms and values that you want them to align with. Right. But outside of that, like some stuff, I'm just like, what is this? Mm-hmm. But I can't force my upbringing and my thought process on them in a total different generation. No, I hear you. But you could advocate. She, what if she was? She, she could, could advocate. advocate for herself. She can. She can advocate for herself. But in a public setting, you cannot tell someone how to speak. Right. She wasn't. That's why she was like, "Hey, well, let me talk to him a little bit." Yeah. So that I when think I it asked, was a good thing. Yeah. I was. A, I think it was a good thing, but I also think we need to be accountable again and take responsibility. You and took your parents to your, a Rams. You put yourself in a. I can't go to. I can't go to a brothel, and then expect a man not to ask me for right. sex. For my, you know what I'm saying? Right. It's like I'm right. putting my and be like, "Oh my, you asked don't me that." Yeah. Don't be. Don't you. I put myself in that atmosphere and then expecting them to treat me like I didn't put myself like that doesn't make any sense. No, I know what you're saying. Be mindful of your environment. Mm -hmm. That's that's true. Well, I guess she'll try. I don't know what she's going to try to do the next time she's at a Rams (laughs) game, but we'll see. Maybe let's just not take them. Yeah. No, they love the Rams. So she was really proud and I was proud of her too, though. That was a good, that was a different, that was a step away from what she would have normally well, it, done. Commend her. Oh yeah. For trying it was a, still different, growth. A, yeah. a different solution, mm-hmm. you know, and as we grow is, it's in increments, you know, right. in therapies and step. increments, mm-hmm. as long as the client is basically making progress, then that's the only thing we're worried about. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but as long as they get to the point, cause we want them to make, you know, small yeah. baby steps. So she made a baby step. So we'll clap for that. But <laughs> it's okay. we're wrapping up. Uh-huh. I really appreciate, you know, having you on here, you know, tell them something about yourself that maybe I didn't get to ask, or we didn't get to touch on. Something. Okay. Now you're going to put me on the spot. Something. I, hmm. I can't think of anything fast enough. Okay. So tell them where they can find you. You can find me at Tiffany O Wellness on Instagram, um, or my ther for my therapy services. It is you can contact me at colormewelltherapy.com. Okay, <laughs> and from our mouths to God's ears, you'll see our show on somebody's network soon. Yes, very soon. It, it, it's super dope, and I, I'm mad. I'm just like we spend all this time, and then we get there, and it's like ah, how we put it out. No, we good. We're good. We're good? Yes, we're good. Uh, we're going to figure it out. We're okay. going to figure it out. Okay. <laughs> so with that being said, thank you for tuning in. Talk with Sunia. And until next time, as I always say, continue to break cycles. <laughs> Is that a wrap?